Hey everyone, Tim here from Snap Attack. Let's dig into this week's Threat Snapshot. So not too long ago, we covered RMM tools, and we talked about how threat actors were using and abusing those legitimate tools as command and control within networks. This is gonna be a little different take on an RMM tool, and you know the hypothesis today here is, what if that RMM tool has multiple security vulnerabilities inside of it? So we're going to dive in and take a look at uh, ConnectWise's Screen Connect. So this is a popular RMM tool. It's customizable with extensions, which gives a lot of organizations, particularly like MSPs, um, your managed service providers, the ability to you know, offer additional assistance and support in ways that some other tools don't. So because of that, it's very popular. It's got both a cloud-hosted version as well as an on-prem version. And we're specifically going to be looking at the on-prem version today because the cloud versions have been already patched. Um, this escalated very quickly. This vulnerability was disclosed on Monday. Uh, there are POCs within a day or two. And um, yeah, it's a pretty nasty vulnerability here. Um, people have been looking, uh, scanning, you know, Shodan census, trying to see how many hosts are affected. There's probably about 8,000 on-prem versions that are exposed to the internet and vulnerable. So definitely something that needs to be patched. I can already see, you know, motivated threat actors, initial access brokers, you know, getting access on these vulnerable machines, selling that could lead to ransomware and other nasty things. Um, ConnectWise, again, trying their best here. Um, they're not a security company. Provided us three I IOCs, so three IP addresses that we can use to block. Um, I think there's more than three IPs out there on the internet, so let's see if we can do a little bit better with some behavioral TTP detections here. Um, let's talk a little bit about the vulnerability itself, and you know, shout out to Huntress's detection engineering and threat hunting or death team. Um, did some fantastic work here. Whenever there's a you know big vulnerability out there, again, they spend some you know burn the midnight oil. They will you know figure out. They'll create a POC for it to you know protect their customers. Um, they're always on, you know, ahead of things. So definitely shout out to them. So if you kind of follow along with this, they recreated the exploit. It was trivial. Didn't release it until there was a POC available, and this is the extended write-up. So there are two CVEs here, and we're going to talk about them. So the first is an authentication bypass, and it feels like we've talked about this before in other threat snapshots where there is a setup wizard and, you know, for one reason or another, you can basically reinstall the software after it's already been installed. So they did some patch diffing to see what was here. Um, again, this is also really nice because um, it's a, a Microsoft.NET application. There's, you know, ASPX files where it's very easy. You don't even have to really decompile it. You can just see the raw source code. So super easy, again, for an attacker or a security researcher to figure out what happened, what changed. Basically, what was going on here is that the setup wizard path, um, again, if that was modified to really have literally anything in it, uh, literally anything, you could reinstall because, uh, again, it was kind of tricking the, the test case, the check into saying like, um, yeah, this path can, this is a different path because originally if it's installed, we're not going to allow you to access setup wizard, but this is treated as a different path and the way that, you know, the .NET application resolves it would bypass that check. So um, the crux here is that you could basically reset the administrator password and then log in. So inherently that's not too terrible, um, but really this comes into play with another vulnerability, um, which is the path traversal. So Screen Connect, as they kind of talk about here, um, again, allows you know extensions and really by extensions, you're allowing somebody to run code because it is a, a management tool. It's by default going to run a system in an elevated context. Again, like what if I need to, you know, reset a user's password or install an application or do some other things. So by default, it's elevated. Not really a vulnerability in and of itself, but again, it leads to vulnerabilities if you can, you know, change and have, you know, control your own code. So what the path traversal piece is doing is allowing us to write a web shell into a particular folder. Again, more or less their web root. And then we can interact with that web shell very trivially, trivially to, um, you know, run arbitrary commands as system here. So um, there are some detection guidance too that they put out. Um, it's on the Sigma Community Repo. We'll talk about those at the end. 
Um, fantastic writer if you want to learn a little bit more about this, if you wanted to see some history of the software too. Um, Cyber has, uh, again, their own little research. This is, uh, again, from 2022, so this is a little bit dated. Um, but if you just want to see the, the type of vulnerabilities that the software has had in the past and, uh, frankly speaking, the maturity of their security engineers and their practices here, you can kind of get a little flavor at this. So, um, you know, for the cloud version, it was very easy to sign up, get an account. Um, one of the vulnerabilities that they found was that you could, um, yes, uh, sign your own you know, or they would you could provide your own installer um, from a file and they would again add that you know as a signed verified publisher so you know very easy to pull off with you know phishing if you again just got a free trial um, lots of other things in here which again don't have the time to talk about and a little out of scope because this has been patched but um, in other ways that you can get code injection remote code execution take over you know control of you know this so it's also was you know talked about at defcon um interesting stuff definitely worth a read i'll link it in the, the video notes uh poc here so again this was put out there a uh, little bit earlier this week um this is the one that we're going to actually take a look at in snap attack um two pieces to this to do that authentication bypass and then put the shell in so those are the two here the batch ad user and then the rce piece um, for those of you security researchers that, again, want to create your own POC, again, usually for the purposes of testing detections and things, um, it's always fun trying to go through this process. So what we've seen and what I'm sure a lot of you have seen as well is if you don't already have that software, you're going to go to the vendor, you're going to try and download a trial, obtain that. So you can easily get a trial of the cloud version. That's already patched. That's not going to give us anything so you can't download a trial of the on-prem version um, you have to talk, talk to support at the moment they are not provisioning trials so a little bit of a shout out to the companies who do this um, whenever there's a vulnerability to prevent you know bad actors malicious people from you know reverse engineering the tool you know weaponizing it a lot of times they lock down trials so yay i guess thumbs up to that um, downside is you can still download the trial binary from their website as well as all the historical versions and again because it is you know an aspx file because the code is source code is like right there um you know you can just patch out the trial check in the setup wizard piece and not even put in a key and install and go on your way so not really a vulnerability but just a, a little pro tip out there and yet another kind of thing with this software where you're surprised somewhat of how many bad coding practices there are in here. So, um, all right, let's actually dive in. Let's talk about what this looks like. So we emulated this threat in snap attack. Um, we've got ConnectWise installed on a Windows machine. Not really anything interesting visually here. I'm going to pivot over to our Linux machine and we're going to see a couple of those steps here. So we can watch, watch the video really quickly. There's three pieces. So that first part is going to be that batch add user. This is going to run that setup wizard again, and we're going to create a new account. You can see here that user snap attack, password, password one. Then we're going to do the um, remote code execution part, which is going to do that directory traversal, uploading a malicious plugin, which is going to drop that web shell in that folder, which we can then interact with. Run who am I? We're going to see that we're running a system, like we said. Not really a flaw because this is intentionally running a system. It's not overprivileged because again, you have to, you know, manage this remote computer. But that is definitely something there to be concerned about, um, especially now if this, you know, is an on-prem managed version and it allows access to a lot of other things. What does this lead to? So um, good news, lots of detection opportunities. We'll talk through those here in a minute. Um, Let's take a look. What does this look like on process graph? Um, again, always interesting to see what we, you know, spawn here. So we have our ConnectWise service that's running. Again, as you would expect, you know, if we're going to run that plugin, that's going to run as, you know, almost the web shell there. You're going to see CMD spawning underneath. Again, this is running as system. Who am I from there? So you can imagine if you have CMDs or PowerShells or other weird processes spawning from ConnectWise, that could be bad. Um, at the same time, if your extensions are allowing this sort of behavior too, um, might have some false pause reduction or some tuning to do because, again, this is a very flexible tool, allows you to, again, run some of these arbitrary commands for troubleshooting and things. So 
double-edged sword, but something to talk through. Um, let's talk through detection, threat hunting strategies. What can we do to protect ourselves from this? So lots of different ways that you can, you know, check this depending on your telemetry sources available. If you've got web application logs or network data, you can see a lot of times the authentication bypass directory traversal pieces. If you've got, you know, process events, you can see, you know, that parent-child relationship and, you know, rare or weird uh, child processes spawn. You can see file creation events where these temp files and these web shells are being, you know, dropped and run. Um, and then there's some other things that we can do here too. So um, taking a look, like we said, um, network, if you have, you know, bro Zeek data, um, or you can also look at this from a, an application log standpoint, if you're, you're logging those requests, you know, we can see setup wizard is being called as a post method, looking for that event target piece. This is a, an easy way that we can see setup wizard is being called again. Um, we can also look for the extensions being installed. This is more of a hunt query because, again, we're just looking to see any extension being installed. But theoretically, that should be relatively rare. So if the timing is we have an extension installed recently and that wasn't done, that could be a good hunting query that you could use, um, you know, rapidly. Talked about that, you know, parent-child process relationship piece. So, again, anything that's spawning from that Screen Connect service, you know, your CMDs, your PowerShells, any you know process you could just say any process that spawns you could look for and hunt for specific ones we chose to be a little bit more prescriptive here with the, this detection but um, again this this is definitely something to look at keep in mind context if your organization has extensions that allow these sort of things you know that might be a little bit more normal in terms of traffic so um, but honestly that should really be running more on the, the client not the server so um, this would still probably be a pretty good detection here um, looking at the web shell, so again, we talked about this dropping a file um, to disk. So um, easiest ways, again, so you're not doing like a, a true compilation, um, you can create an ASPX or an ASHX web shell, and that directory traversal is going to put it into this directory here, which is going to be that web root. We can see that web shell is being created. That's what we're going to connect to and then run the commands as. You can see that that's, you know, being, you know, dropped and run as system. So that's going to be able to allow us to, you know, interact with the, um, the application as well. A um, couple other interesting ones just here because of the way that this is being done. So .NET applications, that ASPX file, um, it may be, you know, compiled and we're going to see some artifacts here. So this was actually from, you know, um, Splunk's library as a Sigma rule. So we can see CSC is going to um, compile a file, and this is Screen Connect running CSC, which is going to be creating that you know extension. This in of itself is a little bit noisy, but you know we can see that there is a temporary file, this DLL that's being created as part of that extension. Um, so this is something that you could use to detect on and hit as well. Um, as I mentioned, Huntress had a lot of good detections here. They have a separate blog post that they talk about, you know, how they went about their detection approach. Um, so they can talk through, you know, if that user XML file, which is where the users are stored, is changed or updated. That's one option. And then they talk a couple more um, strategies here, too, about auditing, you know, file changes on here. Um, two sets of detections are going to uh, rely on you to configure um, an ACL on the directory to you know, you know, log whenever any event or any file is changed. Um, when you set up this ACL, this is going to trigger a Windows 4663 event to um, you know, be logged. Um, speaking very frankly, again, this is a valid detection engineering strategy, but if you're already logging onto the vulnerable host to set up this ACL, why don't you just patch the system? Anyway, carrying on. So yeah, these detections, um, you know, shout out to them. They release in the community. These are ready in the Sigma community repo, which we pull into snap attack. So you can see a couple of these. Um, one of them, this is going to look at the, you know, web server logs. Um, again, you would have to be pulling these off of the uh, application. Um, again, this isn't necessarily, again, it's not running as IIS. It's running as that service account. So it's a little bit different here, but um, could be a valid detection strategy. And then they've got um, a couple others that they talked about. So that user database modification and the, um, the web shell creation through the path traversal. So 
These are going to use, you know, a, a regular file creation event. Um, could be Sysmon, could be your EDR. So looking for a Screen Connect service, writing to, I believe it's C, Windows, Temp, Screen Connect, and again, that XML file. Um, very similar for the path traversal. We want to see if Screen Connect is putting a file, um, really going to be one of those web shells, so that ASHX or ASPX in that directory. Similar to the one we have, um, again, that could be a possible detection strategy. These two, like I said, are going to require you to set an audit policy um, to log, and that would show up as 4663. So these will not work out of the box, but if you are operating in a Windows environment and you don't have that EDR log, you could you know, come up with something very similar here. So because we don't have that audit policy here, we're not going to have any matching logs in Snap Attack, but uh, theoretically this could also be applied. So those last two detections that I showed also are able to you know, be used, again, with that modification. But ultimately, based on the trivial nature of this, because of the severity, because of, um, again, the fact that this is oftentimes exposed online for the on-prem version, uh, again, making it easier to access, definitely want to patch this and patch this quickly. So that is our threat snapshot for this week. It's a weekly series. Be sure to like, subscribe, and we'll see you next time.